Alrighty, everyone. I think we're about ready to start. So, hi. I want to welcome you to That Works, Quine's and other delightfully useless programs. Um, by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that all of you will be able to look at the background of this slide and say, of course, I know what that does. It's incredibly obvious. I mean, look at it. Um, it's Ruby. That is valid Ruby. So obviously, that it's, it's all very simple. Ruby is such a readable language that you can, you can write code like that. It's great. Uh, so my name's Colin Fulton. I'm a front-end developer for a security company called Arbor Networks. If you want to get in touch with me, I'd recommend emailing me because I only just joined Twitter and I actually haven't tweeted anything yet. And if you want to see stuff like I do in this talk, I'd recommend following me on Twitter, though, because I'll be posting more stuff later. Uh, also, all of the code that you see in this talk that I personally wrote is available on GitHub. Some of it actually just uploaded, and it's all under open source licenses. So if you want to use this in your production code, you can use it for free. It's great. Don't do that. <laughs> so I want to start this talk with two stories about playing with computers. The first is in the 1830s. Charles Babbage um, was working on a problem and got Ada Lovelace, whose full name is that long name, which is why we all call her Ada Lovelace. They're working on this problem. Uh, back in the time, if you wanted to do math, you didn't have computers, you didn't have calculators. And so if you wanted to do lots of calculations, you'd often use log books. And all these books are, are tables of logarithms of different numbers together. Lots and lots of tables of numbers. The problem is, if you don't have computers, how do you calculate a giant book full of logarithms? And the answer is you calculate it by hand. Hundreds and hundreds of pages of thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of calculations. As you can imagine, a couple errors creeped in there over time. Now, if you're doing astronomical calculations, this isn't too bad because you're just doing science and whatever. If there are inaccuracies in there, it doesn't affect anyone. But if you're doing naval computation or military computation, this kind of thing could get important. And so the errors in the logbooks were a major issue. Charles Babbage tried to figure out an engineering solution to this problem. Now, he never actually built the device that he came up with, but we do have this, the beautiful fragment, just a segment of the machine that he was trying to create and design. What this is, is it's a mechanical device made out of steel and brass, and you input some initial numbers into it, and you turn a crank on the machine, and the full-size machine would run through all of the calculations mechanically. And unlike a slide rule, it actually would do exact calculations. If a wheel was off by just a half turn, the entire machine would jolt to a halt, so it wouldn't make mistakes. But of course, if you're just going to calculate the numbers, that isn't good enough because those numbers have to be copied by printers and laid out to actually print on a printing press. And so the full-size version of this machine had designed into it an actual printer that mechanically would lay out all of the numbers and in future versions of it could actually let you adjust the kerning and the spacing and the layout of that table. He never got to build this because, as you can imagine, this was a very, very difficult device to design in the 1800s. And Charles Babbage was a horrible, horrible human being to work with. He's just monstrous and terrible and didn't give any respect to the person who was actually manufacturing this for him. And so, while he was working on this, he came up with some ideas. And since the project uh, ended, he ended up trying to work on those ideas and came up with the idea of the analytical engine. He thought, why would you have a machine whose sole purpose is just to calculate log tables? That's very useful for this one case, but we don't want to make a separate machine for every problem. So the idea with the analytical engine, it would be a giant machine built out of steel and brass, which would actually calculate generic programs. This is the first real general purpose computer that anyone came up with. It had the equivalent of serial buses on it, of registers, it had opcodes inside there, it even had some uh, microcode on the inside for optimizing certain op uh, operations. This device was way too complicated to build, and he didn't fully comprehend a lot of computer science. For example, well, because it didn't really exist back then. For example, the registers in the largest versions of the machine that he thought about could store a hundred uh, digit numbers in them. And that's not a hundred binary digits. That's a hundred decimal digits. No one needs that level of precision in their programs, but he thought it might be interesting that you could do it, and because it was general purpose, you could just add more digits to the registers. Now, this device was purely made for crunching numbers. Where Ada Lovelace came in, is she was helping Babbage work on this uh, and was writing some papers for him, and she had an idea. The analytical engine might act upon other things besides numbers, where objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations, computer programs, 
Supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relation of pitch sounds in the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expressions and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. What Ada Lovelace is noticing here is that if you have a general purpose machine, yes, it can only operate on the numbers, but those numbers can represent anything uh, that you can sort of programmatically deal with. That could be music, that could be text, poetry. She predicted the information revolution before computers were invented, before the electric light was invented. This is a wonderful, wonderful uh, observation, but at the time, no one really made anything of it because one, this device was never made, and two, why would you want a machine that could compute music or like calculate images? That doesn't make any sense. And as we know today, it totally isn't useful and we don't all rely on it every single day. Um, sometimes toying around with computers like this can change the world. Ada Lovelace wasn't the only person to just play around with computers and come up with a world-changing concept. The Linux kernel itself was created by Linux as a hobby project. He didn't think it would go anywhere, and in his original post, he thought that he'd only support one kind of hard drive, because that's the only kind of hard drive that he had. Now we know today, the Linux kernel obviously a little bit more popular and relied on by a couple more people, but that isn't where it started. It started just playing around with code. Ruby was created when Matz just wanted to play around with code. The world didn't need another scripting language, it didn't need another object-oriented language, but Matt's wanted to have a little fun, and obviously we're all here today because he was just toying around with code. This talk is not about that. This talk is about having fun, but not that kind of fun. It's more about this story. In the 1970s, a man named Steve Dompier was part of the MIT uh, Home Compu Homebrew Computer Club. And this is a club where they just play around with computers. Now, in the 1970s, computers couldn't do very much, and he had just gotten one of these machines. It was a kit that you could build called the Altair 8800. As you can see on the front, you have a bunch of switches and lights, and that's all that you have. If you want to program this machine, those switches will let you individually switch on signals to each line of the address bus, and using another switch, you can individually uh, pipe that data into the machine line by line on the address bus. This is very time consuming. This isn't just writing assembly code, this is writing machine code in binary using dip switches. Not the greatest way to program, but everything has to start somewhere. Now when he was playing around with this machine, he had a radio turned on next to him at one point. And he noticed that when he ran certain programs, little bleeps and bloops would come out of that radio. If you've ever had a Bluetooth speaker with an iPhone near it, you may have noticed that while your iPhone is turned on, a little bit of noise comes out of it. And the reason for that is radio interference. If you look in the back of most electronic devices, you'll see this symbol these days. This is a symbol for the FCC. They regulate what you can do uh, with electronic devices. They make sure that, for example, your computer doesn't spew out lots of electromagnetic magnetic radiation so that if someone's standing nearby with a pacemaker, their pacemaker doesn't fail. They also ensure that devices like pacemakers aren't going to be susceptible to that kind of interference. Well, back in the 1970s, this wasn't as big a concern because computers weren't as prevalent, clock speeds were a lot slower, and so these devices weren't very very well shielded. So what he was picking up on that radio was the sound of the computer making computations. And he thought, huh, that's interesting. Let's play around with that. So he went about in the code and figured out that if I, if I access these specific uh, memory addresses, I get these specific tones. And I believe he pulled out his guitar and he checked what note that was. And he said, oh, okay, that's a C. He tried different addresses, different operations, came up with different tones, and eventually wrote a program that would play music via the radio interference coming off of his computer. Nothing useful came out of this. This is obviously just a toy thing that he did for fun. It's incredibly elaborate, there's no point to it, but he and his friends had a lot of fun doing this kind of thing. Obviously later we just added speakers to computers and audio ports, because that's a much, much better way to make music. But this is programming for programming's sake, and that's what I want to talk about today. Programming just for the fun of it. Not trying to make something useful, not trying to make an open source project that's going to take over the world, not trying to work on some big production website. No, it's just about programming for the sake of writing code, because we enjoy writing code. Now there's good code, and that's what we talked about for most of RubyConf. We talked about good code. How to write code that's efficient, that's performant, that's easy to read. And there's bad code. We talked a bit about that. We talked about how to write code that is uh, not inefficient, that doesn't have all those aspects um, that we associate with bad code. But we're going to talk about fun code in this talk. Now, fun code can be non-performant, which would put in the class of bad code, and it's completely useless, which would put in the class of bad code, and it's usually 
terrible in terms of readability, uh, as you'll see from later slides in this talk, but it's fun. And more importantly, oops, it's fun. It's really fun. This kind of code is just a blast to write, at least if you're the kind of person who enjoys just tinkering, tinkering around and doing problem solving. Now a warning. This talk contains really, really ugly looking code. And I mean really ugly looking code, written in horrible ways. So if any of you are sensitive to bad code, if any of you has recently had bad experiences on real projects, you may want to leave now because this may give you flashbacks to terrible, terrible times. That being said, I hope none of you have ever seen code like this because this is my reaction if anyone ever does any of this in production. <laughs> but let's just sit back, let's relax, let's take some time, and I'll explain how all this really terrible code works. So first I want to talk about esoteric programming languages. Now esoteric programming languages are languages which aren't really for practical purpose, but they can usually compute anything that any other language can, and are either very difficult to write in, or just sort of play around with interesting ways to write programs, because there's more than just sort of the standard C syntax that we're all used to. One of these is a language called BrainFun. Okay, I'm lying. The language isn't actually called brain fun, but sometimes children attend these talks, so let's refer to it as brain fun. And those of you who know Ruby in the audience will understand what I'm talking about. Brain fun only has these operations in it. Each operation is only one character, which makes our code nice and small. And as you see here, there are only eight operations. And what they do is very simple. Brain fun assumes that your environment is an infinitely long tape of integers. And there's a pointer pointing at one of those integers. If you uh, use this operation, it will take that pointer and move it one over to the left. This operation will move the pointer one over to the right. The increment operation takes the number that that pointer is pointed to and increments it by one. Decrement, on the other hand, decrements by one. Now this isn't very interesting, but we can use the period operator to output whatever is underneath the current pointer into a stream that the program is outputting to, usually standard out. You can use the comma operator to take a byte from the input string, often something like standard in, and put that where the current pointer is. Now these operations alone do not give you a Turing complete language. They can't compute everything uh, that you can do with any other language. So we need two more operations. And these are these, the square bracket operators. The first square bracket operator uh, looks at the uh, number that you're currently pointing to and checks, is it equal to zero? If it is equal to zero, it jumps in your code to the matching square bracket operator. Um, if it doesn't equal zero, it's gonna go ahead and jump to the, it's just gonna go ahead and continue to evaluate the program. And so you can write loops where you iterate on a bunch of numbers and then zoom back to a number decrement it down by one, and keep going over that code until eventually that number hits zero, and then you can jump ahead and execute the next part of your code. Now, that's all you need to do all computation. In fact, someone wrote a brain fun interpreter in brain fun. I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, you can't implement the brain fun interpreter in the brain fun interpreter, but with some modifications, you could go ahead and do that. Uh, another example of an esoteric programming language is JSFun. And again, it's not called JSFun, but let's all pretend it's called JSFun. JSFun is a different kind of esoteric language. It was created as a parody of a language which we all like, or some of us like, called JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript is an interesting language because it does type juggling. You can actually change between a lot of the different types in the language um, implicitly by performing certain operations. So JSFun takes advantage of that. It started when a couple of programmers on a forum wondered how few characters do we need to write any JavaScript program? And I don't mean a Turing complete subset of JavaScript, I mean how can we represent any program in JavaScript using a subset of the characters that we normally use to write code? So we can evaluate strings as if they're code in JavaScript. So if we call the function prototype and pass in a string, it'll evaluate it that as if it's code. Okay, so we're still using all the characters, but this gets us one step closer. We don't need all of those letters, though. We can take numbers, which are the numbers that uh, correspond to the ASCII values for every single 
uh, letter in the alphabet, and we can turn those numbers into strings and then concatenate those strings together. So now we're only using a couple of letters, enough to get us the function prototype, the string prototype, and the from car code ca uh, function. And then we use parens, the dot to call, the plus to uh, concatenate things together, and then all of the numbers. So now we can get pretty close to having a much, much reduced subset of JavaScript. But look at all those numbers. Do we really need, like, all of the numbers? I mean, zero through nine, doesn't that seem a little bit kind of redundant? Instead, we can just use one and just add on one as many times as we need. Now, we also need zero to represent zero, but luckily, we're not going to need that in most cases. Um, so this will get us closer, and now we've eliminated all those numbers. Now, the rest of the process of getting to JSFAN starts getting a little bit esoteric. These are all of the symbols that you need to represent any JavaScript program. Six characters. Six characters, and you can translate any JavaScript program into a completely valid JavaScript program that will run exactly the same code in essentially any browser except for some quite old ones. So how do we do it with these six characters? This is an empty array. This makes sense. Is everyone following? Because <laughs> it's going to get confusing. If we apply the not operation to an empty array in JavaScript, an empty array evaluates a truthy, and so not to a truthy object is going to be false. OK. If we apply the not operation twice to an empty array, we're going to get true. This makes sense. The plus operation isn't just addition between two numbers. There is also a unary plus operator, which implicitly converts whatever you give it into a number. So our statement that we already have is true, and true turned into a number is the number one. Now we have a number without using any numbers. <laughs> how do we get strings? Obviously, this is how we get strings. So JavaScript is a very intuitive language. So as we all know, if you take an empty array and add it to another empty array, what it does is it performs the join operation on both arrays, uh, which empty arrays join together with empty strings turns into empty strings, and then you join together empty strings, and then you get another empty string. Very intuitive, makes a lot of sense. If we index into an empty array, using an empty array as a key, JavaScript is going to try and look up a property or a function on the empty array, which is called empty array, which it doesn't have. And so it returns undefined. So now we have undefined, which isn't very useful. Except if we add an empty array onto that, we get the string undefined. Now we have all of the letters in undefined. <laughs> this process carries on for a very long time. And if I remember correctly, the word or the letter capital C under this way of doing things takes about, I think it's 1,800 characters of code to generate. But going through this process, we can eventually get all of the characters that we need. We can concatenate them together. And using some other tricks, we can get that function prototype that we got and call the, everything with the function prototype. And so now we have all of JavaScript in only six characters. These sorts of esoteric programming languages are nothing new. In 1972, two Princeton students who were feeling particularly fresh came up with their own programming language to make fun of the programming languages of the time. It was called Intercal. Intercal obviously stands for compiler language with no pronounceable acronym, because that's the way they rolled in the 1970s. Uh, they like to do a number of things in this language, including have a bunch of new operators, one of which was explained with a massive Boolean logic table and just said, obviously, this is how it works. Uh, the compiler also had a number of features which were undocumented, because that's everyone kinds of favorite. That's everyone's favorite kind of compiler feature, an undocumented one. This one would raise an error if you didn't put the please keyword enough times in your program, saying that your program wasn't polite enough. But if you put in too many pleases, it would also raise an error, because now you're just being cloying. Um, now, you don't have to make an esoteric programming language that's hard to read like all of these. And so I, start, I came up with an idea at one point, and here's what it was. How many are familiar with SAS? All right, so pretty much everyone. SAS is a CSS preprocessor, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, it allows you to have things like variables and functions inside your CSS so you can dry up your CSS. SAS is a Turing complete language, so here's an implementation of Fibonacci using SAS, which everyone knows that you need to put Fibonacci inside of your uh, CSS because everyone writes CSS like that. 
Um, and you probably are all familiar with Lisp now because we talked about the initial talk, but for those of you who aren't, uh, Lisp is a family of programming language. It isn't an individual programming language. The main idea of Lisp is that you represent your program as a series of nested lists. Those nested lists are represented by uh, using parens to enclose your Lisp. The first item in the Lisp is usually, but not always, interpreted as the name of a function, and then the rest of the items of the list are the arguments of that function, so you can chain together a bunch of things. So here, in a very primitive form of Lisp, uh, we're defining a global variable. We're calling it Lispfib. We're assigning a lambda, anonymous function to that, and we're doing the same implementation of uh, the Fibonacci function we showed in SAS in Lisp. Um, but you know, SAS also lets you write lists with just parens and spaces between things. You don't have to put quotes around strings. So I created Sassy Lisp. This is the exact same Lisp program, but written in SAS, passing it into a function called function eval. Now we don't have time to go into the details of this, but this is about a 50 to 70 line implementation of Lisp inside of SAS, and then there's another 50 lines of helper functions. Uh, you can define anonymous functions, you can create first class functions and compose them together. You can have variable scoping with global and local variables. The, the lambdas actually act as closures, they close around all the local variables defined at the time that they were created. Um, and in addition to all of that, uh, you also get anonymous functions. SAS itself doesn't have anonymous functions, but because SAS is turn complete, we can implement anonymous functions inside of SAS. Don't use this in production code, because one, all of your coworkers will think you're crazy, and two, this is very inefficient. SAS isn't the best runtime for implementing a language, but you can do it, so why not? And this is up on GitHub if you want to play around with it. I also have a benchmark. You can run this Fibonacci program up to about 15 or 14, and around there the stack eventually uh, blows after it sits there for a while attempting to compute lots of lots of inefficient uh, code. It might run a little bit faster in a, if I implement a tail call recursion, but uh, I'm not going to do that until I get really bored. So give me like a week. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna move on to something completely different. Uh, who can tell me why the map function is better than each? Anyone? Exactly, <laughs> map is better than each because it is one character shorter. We're gonna be talking about code golf now. <laughs> code golf is the game of trying to write a given programming prompt in as few characters as possible. Let's try playing around. Here's FizzBuzz. FizzBuzz is a very simple program. You're gonna print out the numbers between zero and 100 on standard out. Very easy to do. Except you're gonna replace numbers that are divisible by three with the word fizz, numbers that are divisible by five with the word buzz, and numbers that are divisible by both with the word fizzbuzz. Here is a very simple implementation of that in Ruby. We use the modulus function to check whether or not things are divisible by certain numbers, and then we output various strings. All right, this is not a great implementation, but don't worry, because we're about to write an even worse implementation. So the first thing that you want to do in Code Golf is look for repeated things, things, patterns that are going on multiple times. In this case, we're calling puts multiple times there, and we don't need to do that because the if statement is gonna return a value. So we can pull out that puts, put it on the end there. Okay, that's good. But now we have all of these uh, repeated equality checks. And we're never gonna get a negative number out of this function. So why don't we just check if the number, not if it's equal to zero, but if it's less than one. That will do an equivalent thing for this bit of code. And we just saved three characters. Pretty good. If we use case statements, we can remove those repeated calls to the modulus function and dry up our code just a little bit more. Um, and this is good, but we still have all those case and when and um, Sorry, there's a little typo in there, but you still have all these cases when the else block. And so we can do better than this. This is not exactly the easiest read to think, but instead of using case statements, we're using a ternary. We're checking if the number is divisible by three. If so, we're gonna return the word fizz. If not, we're gonna return an empty string. Then we can concatenate that on to doing the same thing with buzz. Then we're gonna check to see if that's empty. Uh, if it is empty, we're gonna turn the value that we got. If not, we're gonna turn the output because it says either fizz, buzz, or fizz, buzz. Um, this is pretty good, but we can do better. This refactor is a little bit more confusing, so let's take a closer look. We have an array which only has one item in it, the string fizz. We then index into that by calling modulus on the value of three. So if the value is equal to zero, which is what we want to check, it'll get the first item out of that array, which is fizz. If not, it's gonna return nil. 
And so if we put or empty string in there, we can then, it's not a little bit shorter, but this actually lets us do this next refactor, which is totally readable. This code is getting better, right? <laughs> Alrighty. So we're going to have the same thing that we had before, except now inside of that uh, string with fizz, we're going to do string interpolation. And inside of there, we're going to put the same thing, but with buzz. Um, so now if this returns, uh, if this doesn't return buzz, it's going to return nil. And in string, doing string interpolation with the value nil gives us an empty string. That's pretty close to what we want, and so this is most of the way there, but you see there's an empty space. The problem here is that if it's divisible by five but not divisible by three, the buzz value is gonna get thrown away and the whole thing's gonna return nil. So if we just uh, put a little equality statement inside of our string interpolation, string interpolation and put an or on the outside of that, we can pull out that uh, little bit of code. So then we have this. But now that puts with the output empty at the bottom, we don't need any of that. Instead, we can just put the value on the end of that or. Um, and then we have like multi-character variable names, and I know I personally hate those, and I know everyone else hates multi-character variable names because they make your code so readable, so let's get rid of those. We're using do n blocks, which is idiomatic Ruby here, but that takes up extra characters, so we don't do that. And actually, let's make it idiomatic Ruby. Let's just remove all that white space and put on one line. So here we have fizzbuds. Our original implementation, including white space, was 171 characters, and our new implementation, with that one little bit of white space in there, is a total of 56 characters. If you can write a shorter implementation of fizzbuzz, I'd really like to see it. I'm sure that there is one in Ruby, but this is getting to the point where any bit of code that you delete is gonna make invalid Ruby syntax very fast. Another way that you can have fun with programming is by doing obfuscation. The International Obfuscated C Code Contest is a great example of people just writing obfuscated C code. And if you thought that C code was hard to read, you should see what these people come up with. They are beautiful, and I mean beautifully ugly programs. Yusuke Endo is one of the core maintainers on Ruby, and he is a master of obfuscated code. He has won the IOCCC multiple times, including with this one called the Most Overlooked Obfuscation. And this one we have to run because if you're a C developer, uh, this is a good one to see. So we're gonna go ahead and cat our program. And as you see, we have int main. Uh, so that's our main function. We're then gonna call printf, which prints the standard out, and print out hello world with a new line character. This seems like it makes sense. Now you're not including standard out here. That may confuse some of you C developers out there, but in most environments, you can do that. It's okay. The compiler will throw a warning to tell you you're doing something terrible, but that may not always work, but it works often enough, so this should be fine. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna compile this program. So we'll do GCC. We're gonna turn off warnings because we don't need to see that warning message. And then we are gonna output it to a file, which we'll call prog. Runs for a moment, and oops, I actually have to give it a program. Um, they really need to fix that in GCC. They should just assume that they know what program I wanna run compiles for a moment, and then we go ahead and get that. Okay, so now we have a program, and so to run it, we will go ahead and run it. And it printed hello world to the screen, al along with the rest of the program. <laughs> now, look at the initial line up there, look at the final line, it's the same code, and that's what it output. Okay, if you are confused, good. <laughs> I'll make things a little more confusing by viewing this program in less. Now for those of you familiar with less, it prints out code to the screen, it lets you scroll through it, but it doesn't add code highlighting. So why is there an underscore under hello world? Okay, um, I wanna find out what's going on, so let's open this up in an editor. Okay. <laughs> What Yusuke Endo did is he encoded some non-printable characters into his code. Specifically, he printed out a character which exists in ASCII which deletes the previous character. So he wrote out a much longer program which, when you print it to standard out, is going to remove all of that fluff that actually runs the real code and it's just gonna show you a fake program. When GCC evaluates this, it ignores all the escape characters and goes ahead and prints it. And so that is the most obfuscated bit of code. Alrighty. Now we're going to move on to my favorite kind of obfuscated program, the quine. The rules of quines are quite simple. Your program, when it runs, must print out its own source code. This is relatively easy. If it weren't for rule two, 
the program can't actually read its own file. Let me show you why that's a problem. When we want to print something out in Ruby, we use puts, and then we give it a string. Okay, so we want to print out our own program. If we run this, it's just gonna print an empty string, so let's put it in the program. Well, the program starts with puts, so I'm gonna put that in the string. And then I'm gonna run that, and okay, it output the beginning of the program, but it didn't point that, put it, output that string that we want to output. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna escape the quotes, because we need to escape the quotes inside there, and I'm gonna put puts inside of that. And now we have a program that does return the previous program, except now the program's a little bit longer. Um, but we can fix this. If we just keep escaping strings and keep adding puts, infinitely, eventually we will reach our program towards the limit. Unfortunately, Ruby doesn't let us write infinitely long programs. This isn't gonna work, so we're gonna have to be a little bit more clever. We're gonna assign the string with puts of it to a variable and then output that. Now if we run this, it's still just gonna output puts s, but we have the actual code of the program inside of a uh, string, so we can call a val with that. So we'll say eval s equals that string. When we run that, it's still gonna output the same thing, but you'll notice that we're evaluating code now which outputs the, the uh, variable s, and that variable s is contained within the string. So we actually have reference to that string itself inside of the string that we're outputting and evaluating as code. So what we can do is we can add a string that uh, adds the eval s onto the output, we get one step closer. Now we have most of the program, but we're missing those quotes around the outside. Now, if we try and just escape those quotation marks, we're gonna run into the same problem we had before where we keep having to escape characters endlessly and it never works. But we can use the dot .chur method on integers in Ruby, which allows us to take an integer and turn it into an ASCII character. In this case, we need the character 34. And if we run this, we now have a quine. This is a valid Ruby program, which when you run it, outputs its own source code. And if you output what it, or if you run what it output in Ruby, it'll then go ahead and return itself. Hooray, woo. Quines, I like to think of them as the fugues of esoteric programming. Fugue is a very rigid structure in classical music. It's a very difficult kind of composition to write. Bach was a master of writing these. But within that structure, if you're able to write one, you can make really beautiful music. Quines give us a very rigid structure for a program. It has to follow these two rules, which are not the easiest thing to follow, and there are other ways to make quines besides this way. Um, but within that structure, we can play around and have fun. Again, Yusuke Endo, our favorite Rubyist, came up with a quine with the help of a guy named Darren Smith, and it looks like this. This is a valid Ruby program, and if you run this program, it returns itself, pretty easy. Now what all that extra stuff does is it makes it so that if you delete any character from this program, and I mean any character within this program, it still returns the original program. In Yusuke Endo's original implementation, he stored the string for the program multiple times, compared them, found the longer one, and then would print out that multiple times. Darren Smith came up with a much better way to do it, which is to actually have the program know what it should look like and heal any mistakes in it. Unfortunately, his version only worked in Ruby 1.8 and before, so Yusuke Endo took that program, uh, updated a bit so it would work in modern versions of Ruby, and then turned it into this nice bit of ASCII art. Um, so how can you have fun with Quines? That program is really difficult to write. Uh, I've yet to figure out all the details of how it works just because I haven't had the time to read that. <laughs> but it's actually not that hard to write your own fun little Quine. Here's our original Quine, stripping out all that unnecessary white space. And we're gonna add a little bit of code onto the end of it. We're just gonna output the result of one plus one. Now if we run that, it returns two as we'd expect, but you'll note that the, the fact that it's a quine is still maintained. Even though we added code on the inside of that string, it's still outputting the original program with that addition. And this means we can add anything to this particular quine and get it to output um, whatever we want. Now the string that we're evaluating as code has access to the string that we're evaluating as code, as a string. That variable s, which contains the string, is available within the code that we're putting inside that string. That means the code can modify itself. The code can change what it does. So I started thinking at one point. I was working on a different quine, and I was staying up really late watching the DeepMind Go games, and because it was very late at night, and because I was watching a very complicated game, and because I was watch, or, uh, working on a quine, my brain was kind of in a weird space. 
So I wondered, what if I wrote a chess program, which is a quine, and the chessboard is drawn using ASCII art, where the actual code itself draws out the chessboard. I thought of two ways to do this. One would be to strip out all the white space from the program before evaluating it, because some of that white space that we want to insert to make the ASCII art may split up uh, Ruby methods and things and turn it into invalid code. So that would look something like this. We do our normal quine, and we put our magic quine sauce on the inside of that string, and then we just strip out all the white space from that before we avow it. And if we add that little g sub bit inside the quine, everything will work out just fine. This would be easy for some definition of easy. You still have to write a valid chess program and know how to make a quine. But where's the fun in easy? That brings us to option two. We could write a program which runs when white space is inserted almost anywhere in it. So let's walk through what that would mean. Um, here we have a very, very fancy bit of Ruby code. Ruby is relatively flexible in its syntax. So if we had a new line character before the dot, this is still a valid Ruby program that runs the same code. If we put the dot on the other side of the new line character, we still have a valid Ruby program. This still runs the exact same code. We can also put a space in there, which a lot of people aren't aware of. This is still the exact same program, runs the exact same code. We can put the dot on the other side of the space, or my favorite, you can put space on either side of the dot, and this actually works in Ruby. I don't know why anyone would want to do this. It's probably just an artifact of how the parser works, but this is still a valid Ruby code. The problem is this. What happens if a space needs to be inserted to make the ASCII art in the middle of a method name? Now, this is still valid Ruby code, but it's different than the program we had before. Similarly, if we put a space in the variable name, that's going to be a different bit of Ruby code. Now, we could make all of our values single character variables. That would get us partway there. And we could define all of our methods as single character methods, and then have a header in our program which defines out all of our methods as single character methods, and then we have a nice bit of code which would allow us to search spaces anywhere. But is there a better way to do this? And by better, I mean a lot worse, a lot more confusing, because that almost looks like readable code. Lambdas in Ruby can be represented like this. You use the arrow syntax for the lambda, and as many people don't actually know, you can use square brackets to call lambdas. This allows you to have a lambda which kind of acts like a function or an array, or the most common use I've seen for it is people giving talks about lambdas, like me, who need a very compact syntax. Here we have a function which takes one argument, and at the end of it we pass b into that one argument and evaluate some code. Lambdas, this particular syntax, lambdas in Ruby, is really nice because we can put a space or a new line character in every third character. And this allows us to have three character pixels. Uh, now, we do have the problem that, that last bit of, uh, the last line of code right there only has one character in it. But if we put parens around the B, we haven't added any new characters to our syntax. We still just have letters, arrows, and then all three kinds of braces, and we have it. So now all that we need to do is make sure that some code we insert on the inside is also only made out of lambdas, which only contain lambdas, which only contain lambdas, which only contain lambdas. How can we write a program that has all of the rules of chess only using lambdas. Alonzo Church comes to the rescue. Alonzo Church was a contemporary of Alan Turing, and before Turing came up with the Turing machine, he came up with the lambda calculus. He proved that if you have lambdas like that, you have a Turing complete language. That is all that you need to implement all of programming. There have been a number of Ruby talks which you can go to which explain how this works using Ruby. So all we have to do is define all of the rules of chess in untyped lambda calculus and make a chess AI only using untyped lambda calculus. How hard can this be? Well, I started on it about a month ago, and I finally got it fixed up and good about a day ago. <laughs> so let's go ahead and take a look. We'll exit out of this. We will return to the command line, make it a little bit bigger. We're going to cat lambda chess, and here we have a program. It's a long program, but if we look at the top, we call a val like we did before. We have our variable assignment. We're using that percent %q syntax for doing strings. That makes it a little bit more confusing, but also gives us access to both kinds of quotes inside. And then we have the c variable inside that string, and we assign that to a lambda, which, calls, which uh, inside of it has another lambda, and another lambda, and another lambda, a lot of lambdas. I actually ran out of single letter characters in the English alphabet, so I used all of the Greek alphabet. 
and most of the Russian alphabet, and a number of other Unicode characters. But if we go through all of that, we eventually can have all of the rules of chess and a chess eye encoded in untyped lambda calculus. We then need a little bit of helper code in Ruby to encode what pieces look like, to take uh, input from standard in and translate them into this lambda format, because remember, we don't understand numbers or arrays, we only understand lambdas. And then we get lambdas back, so we need a little bit of Ruby code that goes through and uh, translates all of those lambdas back into something that we can output. And then at the very end here, we will see a puts and then a big string concatenation which puts together the final program replacing all the white space. Uh, if we zoom out of this program, we will see that all of that white space makes it pretty. We have lambda chess. Now, let's see if this works. We are going to go ahead and run this program using Ruby. It takes a moment. And then we'll see we get back the exact same program, except all of the white space has been shifted around so that we have a chessboard. Seems pretty nice. All right, now to prove to you this really works, I need a volunteer from the audience, preferably someone named Aaron Patterson. <laughs> I was gonna call on anyone, but I can't resist. Do you know chess? Okay. Can you give me a valid move for white? You're going to be playing against Ruby, who is black. Don't worry. This thing beats me. I'm terrible. <laughs> Just a valid move. Any move. Yeah, bottom. Uh, king's pawn to king's pawn too. Okay. All right, so it takes, this program takes inputs from standard in. Uh, let's go ahead and give us a new line so it's a little bit easier to read. All righty, so we want to do king's pawn, which the king is on the, is it the D rank? E, okay, thank you. Uh, so it's going to be E2, and we are going to E, uh, E4. Uh, you don't have to put the colon in there. You can actually, the syntax is a little bit flexible because I didn't want to deal with parsing, so I just stripped out anything that didn't make any sense. Uh, we're going to run this program now. As you can imagine, this takes a little bit of time. Ruby isn't the best at optimizing this, and lambdas aren't as fast as they could be in Ruby. So if anyone's looking for a good benchmark of lambdas, lambdas in Ruby, go ahead and use this, and we'll see that it moved the pawn and came up with a valid response. Now, this is all fine and good, but this is a quine. So let's go ahead and take that program and we'll pipe it in using the T operation uh, into a Ruby file. We'll go ahead and run that. So this is just going to output the program that we put in, uh, that we're piping in to standard out and then save it off to a file. All right, and let's just make sure that that worked. Now, there's a little bit of randomness that's added to this code, so the response is going to be exactly the same. The same piece is still moved, but okay. The computer decided to respond that way. We will then go ahead and zoom back in, clear that out. We will call Ruby with that new program that we wrote, and we will put in a valid response. So let's take the knight at B1, and we will we'll move it up let's say to uh, C, uh, no, it's, uh, hmm? C3, thank you. Pair programming. <laughs> All right, so now we're taking the program that we rendered previously and calling it with another move. It's gonna go ahead and run this for a while. Um, no pressure at all on me, because I'm really hoping this works. I actually know it works, it just takes a long time. I actually wrote a test suite for this. And so now we'll go ahead and move the pawn, and then it came up with a valid response move. All righty, which that's... Hmm? Oh, move the pawn up one more, thank you. A little bit hard to notice. Um, now, this program isn't just a primitive implementation of chess. For those of you who know chess, you can uh, perform castling in this program, and the AI will do castling. 
You can do promotions by just adding an additional character on the end. So if you're going up to the last row, it will validate that that's a valid promotion. It will promote the piece to one of the valid pieces. The opponent will also promote, but it'll always promote to queen. And if you're familiar with the rules of chess, there's an obscure rule called n passant captures, which I don't have time to go into. It is the bane of chess programmers' existence. This will do n passant captures, which is why we have to store the previous day of the game. A healthy portion of the code is just encoding that. <laughs> Alrighty, so there we have it. Lambda chess. <laughs> that program I just put up on GitHub, so if you want to play around with it, it's there. I also have a folder in there which has the expanded version of it, which has names for all those functions, and you can go through that and see how it works, though understand that it is not the easiest Ruby code to read, but there's about 230 tests to sort of guide you through it, though they're not the prettiest tests because it's not the prettiest program. And I didn't want to write the cleanest test because that would take extra time. So why would we do any of this? Uh, the most concise explanation I have found for explaining to my coworkers why I spend my time writing programs like this is this photo of me when I was younger. I just enjoy doing really stupid, tedious tasks. Uh, if it's a fidgety thing that just takes lots of time, awesome. I'll just go ahead and do that. But also, I like programming. I just think programming is fun. And you know, it's good to write production code, it's good to work on open source projects, it's good to make the world a better place by writing good code for other people to use, but sometimes it's fun to just write code for the sake of writing code. And these exercises are really challenging, but they're almost guaranteed to never be of use to anyone. And sometimes it's nice to just have fun, to not worry about writing code that's interesting, just write code that's amusing to amuse other programmers, and pretty much only other programmers. Most people will have no idea what any of this does. If you want to learn more about this, there are a number of places you can go. There's a lovely talk called Programming with Nothing, which was given by Tom Stewart. This shows you how to write FizzBuzz in untyped Lambda Calculus, and he steps through it step by step, though he skips over subtraction, because addition is easy. Subtraction is really hard. I'll give you a hint. It's done via repeated addition. <laughs> Another talk is Why Not? Adventures in Functional Programming. This was a keynote given at RubyConf a number of years ago. It is a fantastic, if incredibly hard to follow talk in which Jim Wyrick implements the Z Combinator, which is a form of the Y Combinator. Um, what that does is if you have lambdas like this, if you're only using lambdas, you'll note that we didn't have variable assignment. That meant that a function can't call itself. We can't do recursion. But it's a Turing-complete language, and other Turing-complete languages can do recursion. The Y Combinator is a magical thing that lets you do that. Through math, and Jim Wyack attempts, attempts to show you how you can implement the Y Combinator yourself using Ruby, and it's a fantastic talk. I'd recommend also going to at least the YouTube page that Yusuke Endo has. Look at his videos. Especially, I'd recommend starting with his uh, fluid dynamic simulation in C. He writes the most amazingly terrible code you have ever seen. And I mean that as a compliment. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. It is mind-boggling the things that he can do with Ruby and C. He has written other amazing clients, which I really recommend checking out. He also has a GitHub page. If you want to see how to write a Ruby program that returns a JavaScript program, that returns a Rex program, that returns a valid C program, though not necessarily in that order, around 100 programming languages, and then eventually returns the original Ruby program, go to his GitHub repository. It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. If you have time, I can take a couple questions. If you're interested in seeing more code like this, follow me on Twitter. I haven't posted anything yet, but I'm going to slowly over time be sharing more clients like this. And if you want to see what I'm up to and see this kind of code, go ahead and follow me. Um, if you never want to see code like this again, or if you dislike pugs, don't follow me on Twitter. Also, don't talk to me. <laughs> If you want to get in contact with me, you can go ahead and go on Gmail. And again, I'm going to be putting this talk uh, on GitHub shortly, but all the code that I show you that I wrote is available on GitHub, and it's open source. So if you want to play with it, you are in your rights to do so. Thank you.